To my YouTube listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. It'll make a big difference for the Hasidic Story Project. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. The town of Chernobyl that unfortunately these days is known for the nuclear accident that happened in the Soviet Union. But long before then, there were three generations of great tzaddikim from Chernobyl. Reb Nachum of Chernobyl, who of course was one of the closest disciples of the Helig Baal Shem Tov. One of his sons, Reb Mordechai of Chernobyl, who have told stories of, and his oldest son, Reb Aaron of Chernobyl. And the town of Chernobyl was surrounded by great forests. And the way it worked back then, was there would be an auction, and someone would buy the rights to cut down all of the trees for several years at a time. They would cut the trees down in the winter, carry them over the ice and snow by sleds, bring them to the river, and then as the water melted, when the winter ended, the trees would flow downstream until they would be collected and processed and resold. And so it was that one time, a timber merchant from Vilna bought an entire forest near Chernobyl, and being from Vilna, and being a Misnagid, he opened up an office to process the wood, and hired only Misnagdim, opposers to the Hasidim. But there were some extra positions available, and one of the people that was hired for the job was a local Hasid who lived in Chernobyl, and his Rebbe was none other than Reb Aaron of Chernobyl. And one of the favorite pastimes of the workers in the timber shop were making fun of Reb Aaron, since they were misnagdim, and he was a Hasidic Rebbe. But it didn't bother the Hasid. He looked at it as his mission to spread Hasidis, share stories about his Rebbe, and the miracles that he could do. And it happened that the cashier, the treasurer of the timber company, was married for many years, and he and his wife did not have any children. And the Hasid, he said, you know, you should come to my Rebbe. He's a great tzaddik. He can give you a bracha, and maybe you'll have children. What do you think? And this misnagid, he said, oh, I don't believe in rebbies, all this bubamaise, nonsense. What are you talking about? The chassid says, what do you have to lose? Maybe the rebbe's bracha will work, and you'll get children. At first, the treasurer simply didn't want to hear about it. But the other misnagdim that were working there, they encouraged him to go. They said, no, go. Let's prove that this whole rebbe nonsense is really nonsense. Go and get a bracha. Tell us what happened. We'll have a good laugh. So he goes into Chernobyl with the Chassid, and the Chassid introduces the Misnagid to the Rebbe, and he says, Shalom Aleichem Rebbe, this is my friend, he's the treasurer in the timber company that I'm working for in the winter, and he and his wife have not been blessed with children, he's also Misnagid, so be a real Kedush Hashem, sanctifying Hashem's name, if you would give him a bracha to have children. So the Rebbe looks at the Misnagid, and he says, our custom is that you give a pidyon, a donation of 18 rubles, which I will give to Tzedakah. You give the 18 rubles, I'll give you a bracha. So the Misnagid is very skeptical. He says, he needs 18 rubles. Come on, that's a lot of money. But he figures, okay, he's already there. Gives the Rebbe the 18 rubles. And the Rebbe says, May Hashem bless you and your wife to have a child within a year. And since that was in the winter, and as you remember, the way the business worked was when the snows would melt, the wood would travel downstream, and the offices in Chernobyl would be closed for the entire summer. The next winter, the offices reopened, and the office staff reassembled, ready for another season of cutting down trees and processing the timber. And now that everyone's back together, including the Chassid from Chernobyl, everyone says, No! Did you have a child in the last year? And the treasurer says, No. This was such a waste of time and money. I knew nothing would come of this. He said, the whole year my wife and I are waiting to see if she gets pregnant. And she didn't. And he said, I'll tell you something even crazier. I have a non-Jewish neighbor. She and her husband have been married for many years. And they never had children. And this year, she had a child. She didn't go to any rabbi. She didn't give 18 rubles. It's a bunch of nonsense. Of course, as soon as the chassid showed up, he wanted to know what's going on. And the Misnagi treasurer was very upset, and he said, Your Rebbe is just a thief. He takes money and gives nothing back. So the Chassid said, So let's go to the Rebbe and ask him. The Rebbe did give you a bracha. 
You did give tzedakah. Let's find out what happened. And all the misnagin that are working in the office, they said, yeah, let's see what the Rebbe has to say for himself. And so they go back to the Rebbe. And the misnagid standing there with his arms crossed, angry. And the chassid goes to his Rebbe and he says, Rebbe, you remember last year I brought my friend here? He's a misnagid and I told you he needed a bracha for children. And if you were to give him a bracha, not only would he have a child, but maybe he would not hate chassidim so much. But the whole year passed. He gave you 18 rubles. You gave him a bracha and nothing happened, Rebbe. Is that fair? And the Rebbe says, I'm sure you understand, my sweetest friend. It's not my fault if someone takes my blessing and gives it to his Gentile neighbor. Now the Musnagid wakes up and he says, What are you talking about, Rebbe? And the Rebbe said, Don't you know that all of the abundance in the world, that everything in the world, comes from Hashem? But it says in the song by the sea that we say every day in davening, V'yaminu b'Hashem uvul Moshe avdo. And the Jewish people believed in Hashem and Moshe his servant. He said, Every tzaddik, Every Rebbe, we're all an aspect of Moshe Rabbeinu. It's not enough for me to give you a bracha. You have to have faith in the Rebbe. You have to believe in the bracha. But if you leave here and you say, Oh, the Rebbe's full of nonsense. I wasted 18 rubles for nothing. I didn't get anything out of it. The bracha was there, but you gave it to someone else. So now the Masnagat is thinking to himself, What do I do now? The Rebbe is telling him that the bracha was there, but he gave it to someone else. He's thinking maybe the Rebbe is real. Maybe the bracha is real. So he takes 18 rubles out of his pocket and he hands it to the Rebbe. And he said, Rebbe, please bless my wife and I again that we have children. The Rebbe gave him a bracha that within a year his wife would give birth. He came back and he told the story to everyone in the offices. And that whole winter, they all worked together. And they left for the summer and came back the next winter. And everyone said to the Misnagid, No, did your wife give birth? And he said, Yes. It was a miracle. I never could have imagined that the Rebbe's brachas really mattered. And on that first day when the offices were open in the winter, the Misnagid and the Chassid went to the Rebbe. And from that point on, every time the Rebbe had a Fabrengen, a Hasidic gathering, gave a lesson or gave brachas, that Misnagid was one of the first people in line. And by the end of that winter, the Misnagid had become one of the most devoted Hasidim of Rebbe Aaron of Chernobyl. And whenever he would meet somebody who he felt needed a blessing, he would tell them, come to my Rebbe. And when people would say, ah, I don't believe in Rebbe's, Tzadikim, blessings, all this nonsense, he would say, I was once like you. But look at me. Now I'm a chassid of Rebbe What do you have to lose? Come and get a bracha. My good job is good job is good job. So I have another story for you, my sweetest friends. Back in the old days, at least in Europe, many Jews were innkeepers and ran taverns because they were banned from all the professions. There was pretty much no way for them to make a living, and they would end up renting a tavern and an inn someplace very far away from any Jewish community. There was one Jew whose name was Shloimi that moved with his family to a very isolated place. And he was there for such a long time that he stopped really keeping anything Jewish. He didn't dress as a Jew. He didn't keep kosher. He didn't even remember what was Shabbos. Day and night, the tavern was open. And he served drinks to the Polish peasants and put people up in his little inn. And one year passed into the next. And it's true that he was able to support his family. But they had given up on everything their whole Jewish identity, pretty much. And one day, out of nowhere, a Jew walks into his tavern. He's shining like the sun. Shloimi had never seen anyone like this before. He knew what tzaddikim were. He knew what rebbe's were. But he'd never actually met one. And this very holy-looking Jew comes over, says, Do you have any fresh fruits and vegetables I can buy from you? Some grains? He buys pretty much anything he could that wouldn't have any issue with being kosher in a non-kosher tavern. And Shloimi, even though he doesn't look like a Jew, doesn't have a kippah, 
with tzitziot or a beard or even a mezuzah on the door, something deep inside him is moved. And he says to this rabbi, you know, rabbi, I'm also a Jew. And this rabbi was Reb Moshe Leib of Sasov, one of the great Hasidic rabbis. He says, Shalom Aleichem, my sweetest friend. You say that you're a Jew, but how can you live in a place where there's no Jewish community? He said, Rebbe, I didn't have a choice. I had to make a living. The tavern was available. I moved my family all the way over here. It's all I could do. So the Rebbe says, but you don't look like a Jew. You don't keep kosher. I understand that the tavern is open on Shabbos. He says, what am I supposed to do? I have to be open on Shabbos. Where else are the peasants going to buy their drinks? The landlord will kill me. That's the reason he leased me the tavern in the first place. And Reb Moshe Leib, he says, you know, even the animals of Jews don't work on Shabbos. You see that donkey outside? If that donkey is owned by a Jew, he's not allowed to work on Shabbos. And you are much holier than a donkey, my friend. You are a Jew. You must keep the holy Shabbos. And then Reb Moshe Leib, he purchased his fruits and vegetables and headed out to a little hut that he had rented deep in the forest so that he could meditate on the greatness of Hashem. And Shlomila begins to think to himself, maybe I should close the inn on Shabbos. He asks his wife, what do you think? And she's very happy because she didn't want to be in the situation in the first place. And so he announces, Friday night and Saturday, the tavern is closed. And so the peasants started complaining. They said, what are you talking about? Where are we going to get our vodka from? You can't do that to us. We'll talk with the landlord and he'll throw you out. He'll kill you. And Shlomi, he knew that they would. When it came to vodka, there was no messing with the peasants. And worried, he went deep into the forest to find the hut of the great tzaddik. He gently knocks on the door of the hut. He says, Rabbi, I'm sorry to disturb you. I decided to do what you said. Close the tavern on Shabbos. And when I told everyone that I'm closing it, they said they'll go to the landlord and he'll kill me. What am I supposed to do? And with Moshe Leib, he says, Don't worry, my friend. You bolt the doors closed and you don't let anyone in, no matter what. And if the landlord comes and questions you, you tell him straight to his face that you are a Jew and God commanded the Jews to keep the Shabbos day holy, which means that you don't sell anything on Shabbos. The innkeeper was a little worried about this advice, but he decided to trust them the tzaddik. Friday night arrived, and he bolted the doors of his inn. The peasants came, they started pounding on the doors and windows, demanding that he serve them their vodka, but he refused to answer or open the door. And a few hours later, the landlord shows up, and he bangs on the front door. He says, Shlomi, open the door before I kill you with my own two hands. Being really scared, Shlomi opens the door. He sees a very angry Poritz, comes into the inn, and he says, Who do you think you are, little Jew? You're not going to give vodka to your customers? Why do you think I rent this inn to you? So that you can make money, and I can make money. Surely you know Friday night and Saturday are the big days for selling alcohol. Of course, they can't drink on Sundays. You can't be closed on Friday night and Saturday. And Shlomi was scared out of his wits. He says, Your Honor, you're a great man, and I'm sure that every word that comes out of your mouth is truth, and you might not know it, but I keep the Holy Shabbos. He says, What are you talking about? You keep the Holy Shabbos. You've been here for years and years. You don't keep whatever you Jews call it kosher. You don't do anything Jewish. You're just a foolish Jew. And now Shlomi, he got some strength and he says, Your Honor, a holy Jew just came into my tavern a few days ago. He's a righteous man. There's a light coming out of him like the sun. And he told me that the Torah forbids us to work on Shabbos and that I have to close the tavern on Shabbos. So the landlord says, Who is this person? Bring him to me right now. So they went into the forest. They found Moshe Leib deep in meditation. The landlord says, Jew, get up. Why are you spreading rumors that people have to close their taverns on Shabbos? Where does it say that a Jew is not allowed to work for a living? He can rest on Sunday like everyone else. And the tzaddik says, Your Honor, even if a Jew is going to lose his livelihood, he's not allowed to be open on the holy Shabbos. And the landlord, he didn't like this. He said, Why are you causing Shlomi to be tortured? You know, 
it's easy for you to say that you're a rabbi who's sitting here in the middle of the forest meditating on who knows what. But this man, Shloimi, he's got a family to support and this is his business. I doubt if this was your business, you would be willing to close it on Shabbos. And then the landlord, he came up with a plan. He said to himself, I'm going to test this tzaddik and see if he really keeps Shabbos like he says. And they left. And later that day, on Shabbos afternoon, the landlord went into the forest and took gold coins and scattered them in the forest on the way to the tzaddik's hut. And Reb Moshe Leib, he had gone for a little walk. And when he came back, he sees gold coins sitting in the mud on the way to his little hut. He knows that they weren't there before. And he thinks, maybe this is a sign from Hashem. Maybe Hashem is sending me gold coins from heaven in order to help my fellow Jews. Because, of course, everybody knows that Reb Moshe Leib went and helped Jews that were taken captive and would pay the ransom for them. He said, maybe Hashem wants to give me this money. But then he bends down, he looks at the coins, he looks around, he stands up straight and walks into the hut. And the Poritz, the landowner, was watching from a distance. And he comes over and knocks on the door of the hut. And he says, Jew, I just watched what happened. And I'm very impressed. And I've decided to let your friend Shloimi keep the tavern closed on Shabbos. But tell me, why did you ignore the money? Why did you bend down and look at it? And then walk away. And Reb Moshe Leib, he said, You know, at first when I saw the money, I was shocked because it's Shabbos. And of course, I'm not allowed to pick up anything outside the hut because there's no Eruv. But then I started thinking how I could use this money to save so many imprisoned Jews. I mean, it's a lot of money. And maybe the mitzvah of saving your fellow Jew overrides the prohibition of not using money on Shabbos. And so I became confused. And I started thinking, everything is from Hashem. And if Hashem truly wanted me to have this money in order to help my fellow Jews, then He didn't need to give it to me in the mud on Shabbos. Hashem would have to figure out a way to give me the money in an honorable way and in a way that was permitted for a Jew. And so I walked away from the money, putting my fate in Hashem's hands, allowing Him to decide how the money should come to me. So the poet says, Rabbi, you passed my test. And now I realize how important the Holy Shabbos is for you Jews. Any other person would have picked up those coins. They wouldn't have thought twice about it. But you walked past them. And that showed me that much more important than gold is the Shabbos for you Jews. And Reb Moshe Leib said, I've always been careful to keep the Shabbos. And now I see that heaven made sure that the Shabbos kept me. And so from that point on, the poet himself said that the tavern was closed on Shabbos and everyone was welcome to buy their vodka before, but not from the times that Shloimi said is closed on Friday night to Saturday night. And at first, the peasants weren't so happy about it, but because they saw that Shloimi was sincere in keeping Shabbos, they came to respect him. And one day, a Jew and his family was riding through town on their way to take over a tavern far away from any Jewish community. And they pass by the tavern of Shloimi, and they see a sign outside the door. This tavern is closed for the holy Jewish Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night. And when that family arrived at their tavern, they took an inspiration from Shloimi and put the same sign up on their tavern. Because you never know, my sweetest friends, when you do a mitzvah, how it might affect your fellow Jews or even the entire world. <laughs> I la 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 la
Thank you so much for listening, my sweetest friend. As always, I hope you had a beautiful Purim. For those people that got a chance to see me in Jerusalem, I was mamish, mamish high on Purim. And you know, we don't say Havdalah after Purim. And in Havdalah, we say, And the Jews had light and joy and happiness. And of course, that's what we sing on Purim to remind us that Purim never ends and that we always have to bring Purim into the whole year. So may Hashem bless you and bless me back, my sweetest friends, that our days are like Purim and that Purim gets stronger and stronger every day until eventually Mashiach comes. And what's the holiday that's going to be left when Mashiach comes? Of course, it's Purim. Bezat Hashem, we should see it speedily in our days. So thank you again for listening. Make sure to continue, please, sharing your comments on YouTube, sending me emails, sharing this podcast with your friends. And if you'd like to become a contributor and give a financial contribution, you can do so by going to my website, HasidicStory.com, H-A-S-I-D-I-C, Story.com. Every contribution is greatly appreciated. And so is your listening. I hope you have a beautiful Shabbos, my sweetest friends that your preparations for the Seder are beginning already at least. And until next week, the Chaim, my sweetest friends, the Chaim. Chaim.